The Coming of Autumn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Coming of Autumn from the English Countryside by Ernest C. Pulbrook. LibriVox Coffee Break Collection Number 9. One day, as the fall of the year approaches, we wake to find the sun streaming through our casement, as it has done on fine mornings for several months past, but somehow there is a change. There is a sharpness in the air, and a mellow softness in the sunlight, while a slight smell of decay arises from the damp herbage. It is the first day of autumn. Autumn To many, far too many, it is one of the saddest words in the language, for in it they see only decay and death, not recognising that it is really the beginning of new life. There is, after all, no dead season of the year, and that period which so many regard as the end is the beginning. The plant dies down only to renew its strength for the coming year. The young leaves, forming within the twig, press the old ones out of the way, and so autumn is really the first sign of spring. All through the year some plants are dying, but it is only in autumn, when nature in general goes to sleep for a little time, that it becomes markedly noticeable. When autumn comes with its gales and frosts, the townsman shivers, draws the curtain close, and wheels a comfortable chair to the fire, but the countryman goes out to see the beauty of the landscape. If autumn be the time of nature's death, then she dies amidst a blaze of glory, for unless early gales and heavy rain cause the leaves to fall before their time, no month is more gorgeous than October. It is true that the wild flowers have gone, that the song of the birds is almost hushed and the brilliancy of their plumage dimmed, but we have the tints on the leaves, the wild berries of the hedgerow, and the rich colour of the newly turned earth. There is nothing melancholy about a beech wood in autumn. It flames into a riot of yellow and red and orange gold. If a few evergreen trees are to be found in the wood, their dark leaves heighten the effect as the slanting rays of the October sun play on the dying leaves shimmering in the breeze, until the forest seems aglow with molten fire. In spring the white blossom of the wild cherry stood out from the bare branches, providing the only patch of colour in the scene, and now these trees can be picked out by the splash of crimson they make amid the copper of the beeches, the dark green of the sombre pines seeming almost black in contrast. The oaks are not quite so brilliant in their autumn dress, but their russet leaves remain when all the others have gone. In the hedgerow the maples show their presence by their rich yellows, while the tall elms are yellow and orange. In the clearing of the wood the warm brown of the bracken makes broad bands of colour against the dark trunks. Long shadows fall athwart the view where the rabbits sit basking in the sun, their white tails bobbing up and down as they scuttle away when anyone approaches, and some noisy blackbird hurrying off with shrill outcry gives the alarm. The air is very still, and the lightest breeze rustles the leaves and brings them fluttering down in showers, while a sudden gust sends them flying round in eddies. On the common the gorse bushes crackle as the seed pods break, and tall withered stems, topped perhaps with down, are all that remain to tell us of summer. Fungi grow in the damp places, and the hollows are marked by pools of water, while along the common's edge are seen the delicate blossoms of the harebell. In places the hedges are thick with old man's beard, and the falling leaves reveal many a hidden nest. Colour dominates the landscape on a fine day in autumn. Round the homestead are clusters of golden ricks, and the thin column of smoke and the hum which can be heard from afar denote that the thresher is at work. In the apple countries great heaps of golden and rosy-cheeked fruit, presently to be used for cider-making, decorate the orchards. 
the dull yellow of the stubbles is turning into rich brown and red as the ploughman with his team of white and brown horses turns the furrows behind him following a flock of rooks and gulls eager for the grubs and worms he brings to the surface mingled with his cries as he urges his team onwards and the jangle of harness as he turns at the end of the field rises the bleating of the sheep in the fold in the hollow near which the shepherd's hut has already been drawn into position as a volley of shots rings out from the wood where the pheasant drive is in progress all the birds rise in a cloud and wheel round and round the field for several minutes before settling down to their search for grubs once more there is plenty of work a doing for the country has to prepare for the many short days of winter and the coming spring when the earth shall blossom forth once more from the root field comes the creaking farm cart laden with swedes which are being built into a clamp near the shelter of the hedge while in the thicket the woodman is busy cutting the underwood beneath the quick strokes of his hook the bushes are soon cut low and if hurdle making is to follow the sticks are laid in rows all facing one way then when october has well advanced the hurdler comes and under his deft hands the hurdles soon take shape until there is quite a stack from time to time the cart arrives to take a load to the sheltered hollow in the hills where the fold is being erected for the lambing over the meadows flocks of peewits uttering their mournful cry wheel and hover now settling down together now rising all at once to fly round in a circle before alighting in the same spot the starlings are busy in the turnip field searching for fly while crowds of chattering sparrows fight amidst the hedges or invade the rickyards up and down the hedgerows the long-tailed tits swing on the long thin twigs and clamber up the branches all the while uttering their funny little cries the squirrels may sometimes be seen laying up their store of nuts and beech mast but the hedgehog has probably already taken up his quarters for the winter unless the season be very mild in some ways the early autumn is the most glorious time of all the year after a long hot summer the fresh exhilarating days of october act like a tonic on the jaded nerves and if the summer has been wet and gloomy a fine autumn sometimes follows trying as it were to make up for past disappointments there is warmth without heat in the autumn sunshine and it brings out the sweet smell of the freshly turned earth and that damp odour of decaying vegetation which so many dislike over the smithy the crimson of the fast thinning virginia creeper makes even the tiles seem pale in comparison and the red berries on the holly in the churchyard tell us that christmas is not far off the village street is thick with leaves and on saturday the children free from school sweep them up for the garden it is only when the sun has set that the sadness of the season is really present as it sinks slowly into the fast gathering mist the colour suddenly leaves the wood and a chill breeze arises bringing the leaves to the ground all the rich reds and browns and yellows disappear leaving only a dull muddy buff behind the grey twilight steals slowly over the landscape and from the dead colourless undergrowth arises a smell that has little of sweetness in it and the damp mist floats over the low-lying ground it is this sadness of departing day that has given autumn a reputation that it does not altogether deserve end of the coming of autumn by ernest c pulbrook